Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, session on Healthy You, a series of conversations. I am so happy to see so many people in, um, in person, and welcome to those of you who are joining us via Zoom as well. My name is Patty Roberts. I'm the Deputy Director here at the uh, Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department. I'm honored to be before you. Um, this is our ninth session of Healthy You. Healthy You was launched in November of 2020. It's a very, very young program. And, um, but before I go into Healthy You and certainly our fantastic presentation that we've got set, uh, set for you tonight, I do wanna go over just a couple housekeeping um, items. At the registration table, when you, when you came in the door, there is a voluntary sign-in sheet. No one is required to sign it. Um, but if you would like to, you're certainly welcome to. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions um, throughout the presentation and certainly at the end. For those of you in person, the questions are very easy. You simply raise your hand. I will repeat, you will ask your question, I'll repeat it so those of us, so those joining via Zoom can hear it. Um, for those joining via Zoom, please go into the Q&A. Um, session of Zoom and ask your questions. We will be able to answer those at the end of the presentation when Ms. True gets done, okay? Um, also, please turn off all cell phones. We've unfortunately had that occur before, uh, so take this opportunity for that. And the last housekeeping item is um, restrooms. Restrooms are located right out these doors and to the left, all right? Again, I'm so excited to see um, some familiar faces um, to Healthy You and many new ones as well. Um, so let's start talking about Healthy You for a minute. Healthy You is a program that is extremely near and dear to my heart. The topics that we have been talking about in this series of conversations over the last several months are ones that are very real and sensitive in nature. We have talked about depression, anxiety, domestic violence, trauma-informed care, suicide prevention, and opioid use disorder. These are tough conversations to have. I'm fully aware of that. But if they are never talked about, the issues remain lurking and diseases remain untreated. I have a very personal interest in exploring many of the topics um, that, we'll, that we have been discussing and it was just one, a little over 1,052 days ago, um, and yes, I do count in days, that I lost my son, Danny Roberts, who died from a heroin overdose that was laced with fentanyl. Danny uh, died right here in Port St. Lucie. Danny was 22 years old, and Danny had fought, like you cannot believe, for eight years with his uh, disease. I have been on a road of um, education since then to raise awareness to, to this issue. Danny was uh, um, diagnosed with three separate uh, mental health disorders um, in his eight year struggle. Uh, first was anxiety, he was diagnosed with that. The second was depression. Um, and of course the third, well not of course, but the third was bipolar. Um, and I as a parent had no clue what, what any of those were. And had I really known and, and been educated in the medical and the scientific aspect of substance use disorder, um, those are, that's commonplace. So many of our mental health issues are, are, are enmeshed with one another. Um, so that's what started my quest to become more educated, to become more aware that these things, for one thing, for eight years I sat home alone thinking I'm the only one, I'm the only one going through this. And, and had I only been able to speak out, I would have found like I have through this last two year journey uh, with Healthy You and the Opioid Epidemic Awareness Trainings, I am far from alone. Now, that doesn't help with your pain, it doesn't take it away, but it does help to know that we are not alone in this world going through this. Um, so going back, looking at what, what Danny experienced in his t uh, eight year struggle, um, he did um, um, enter a minimum of 14 rehabs and recoveries. And like I said, he did fight. I mean, he, he fought that disease. Um, but again, 
through diagnoses of, of depression, anxiety, and bi bipolar disorder. Um, and once, I thought it was interesting, once I did ask him when he was in re what I call remission, um, he was uh, sober and clean for over two years at that time, I asked him, which one came first, do you think? Do you think it was mental health or do you think it was the substance use disorder? And Dan thought long and hard about it before he answered, and he did say mental health. He thinks that anxiety was his first um, symptom, um, and that started early in high school. And then he started self-medicating. Um, so those are all um, uh, awareness issues and education that I've learned along the way, and then been educated by men mental health pr uh, professionals, such as the lady that we have with us today, um, who's going to teach us and educate us more on dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, one of the other um, items that I did want to share, and, and when, I, when I talk about why Healthy You is Healthy You and what we're here to do is to talk about mental health and raise the awareness is because I want to assure people that I'm not here concealing my own <laughs> um, motives or um, uh, reasons for being here. I'm here to be educated and to talk about these issues. And to do that, I share my experiences. And I, too, as, as I'm sure there will be in this audience, um, I lost my mother from dementia. Um, the year was 2010, and um, she was 76 years old. That's young. That, that is really young. And, um, and sh she, too, had a seven-year battle, if you will, with that disease. And the one, you know, and I'm not, I'm not at all belittling what my mother went through because it was horrible what she um, experienced. But my dad, um, they were married 56 years when mom died. And my dad honored her memory, and she was in her home when she died. And, but that took a toll on my dad. You know, my, my dad's four years old, so, you know, he was um, 80 years old. And um, now he, thank God, he listened to a couple of us kids <laughs> and said, Dad, you need help. You, you've got to get a, you have to have a respite, some type of help. And so he was able to do that. Um, and so he did have help coming in um, that, uh, you know, our children, or us as children did try to help as well. But dad was the primary caregiver, and that's tough. Um, so to whomever is going through those, those scenarios, you have my heart. I've been there, and it is, it's a tough road. Um, so um, I do want to talk just briefly, and then I'm going to introduce our esteemed um, presenter tonight. Um, but throughout COVID um, and, and the impacts from the pandemic, um, our world has become very isolated sometimes and very um, um, isolated, if you will. We, just in the month of last month of May, we actually celebrated for the first time in this department under Healthy You, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And um, through our, and you will meet the, the woman who's here tonight representing our department, um, our fitness centers, um, but we offered nine classes um, throughout May to help people with their self-care and with their mental health. Two of them were guided fitness walks, and um, seven of them were free, everything was free, um, yoga classes. All nine events were held outdoors in our beautiful city parks. And I actually had one person join one of the events who said they have never been outside their home since the pandemic hit. That's huge. That takes courage, that takes um, I, I can't even tell you what that meant for, for me to hear that. And she came out to a beautiful park um, at um, close to sunset, right, Ann? Um, and enjoyed free yoga. And that was her outlet. And, and so that's what Healthy You is all about, is just talking about it and just getting out and moving. And we'll have more of that toward the end of tonight's presentation. Um, but I do want to um, briefly um, introduce and talk uh, a little bit about our next presenter. Our presenter this evening um, joins us, and her name is Donna True. Donna is a licensed clinical social worker, and she is the program development and outreach coordinator for the Council on Aging of Martin County at the Kane Center. 
Prior to accepting her position at the Kane Center, True worked for the Southeast Florida chapter of the Alzheimer's Association for 16 years. True obtained her AAS degree from Farmingdale, Long Island, her bachelor's in social work from Florida Atlantic University, and her master's in social work from Barry University. She has devoted her professional career to working with those who are affected by Alzheimer's or other types of memory loss disorders. She has been a support group facilitator since 1994. Ms. True is on the board of Southeast Florida Honor Flight. That's really cool. I read it, but I didn't assimilate it. That's really cool. Ms. True is the proud recipient of the 2017 NASW Treasure Coast Social Worker of the Year Award, the 2018 Senior Networking Service Award, and the 2012 Fearless Caregiver, Community Fearless Caregiver Award. So without further ado, I would like to bring and forward Ms. Donna True. Thank you so much. Thank you for your heartfelt sharing. Our deepest condolences, and I know I speak on behalf of every person in this room, Patty, for the loss of your beloved son, Danny. And uh, You know, your openness about it is really going to change things for other people as well. When you thought you were alone, they'll know they're not alone, and they have somebody to talk to. Anyway, I have to take a deep breath after that one. All right. I am so impressed with this university, uh, this series, is when Patty first sent me the list, I'm like, oh, I want to go to that one and that one and that one. Amazing things. This is amazing. And now I understand the reason behind it. And it's really very helpful and good information. So welcome, everybody. You're probably wondering, well, why is she here? She's from the Kane Center Council on Aging of Martin County, and we are in St. Lucie County, right? Yes, well, you know what? I used to live probably just a few miles from here back in the old days when the entrance to the Turnpike was actually on the other side of Port St. Lucie Boulevard. Does anybody remember that? Pat, you remember that? Anybody else rem know that the entrance was not where it is now? It's on the other side, off Bayshore. So anyway, just so you know, I've always loved Port St. Lucie and I lived here myself, so I'm back. So anyway, hold on one second. Has anybody seen my glasses? I can't find them anywhere. Anybody? Has this happened to anybody? It's like, where are they? I know I had them. Maybe you took them. I don't know. I'm looking for glasses over there. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, what's, oh. Has that happened to anybody? You lose the glasses. I hope it's not just me. <laughs> yeah, I can be talking on my phone. I'm like, did I bring my phone with me? Where is it? Right? Okay, so that's normal. Really, it's normal. Let's go to some of these slides. That was, I was supposed to already flip to that. Um, tonight, I'm here to talk a little bit about dementia and the changes that are normal with aging and some changes that are not normal with aging. And I think the people that are here tonight are here for a very, probably a very specific personal reason. And I'm happy to stay and talk to anybody afterwards if there's something that you want to talk about one-on-one. -on -one. I won't run out the door if I can help in any way. As Patty had mentioned, when I work for the Alzheimer's Association, my actual, my first office was on Bay Shore across from the elementary school. And so I really know the resources in the area and I'm happy to help. So what happens with memory loss? If you think about it, as we, how many of you on Super Bowl Sunday have seen a 60-year-old football player out on the field playing football? Has anybody? No. We haven't seen a football player that's 60 years old on Super Bowl Sunday playing in any professional football team ever, really. Why is that? I'm, I bet there's people out there that are stronger at 60 than they were when they were in their 20s or 30s because they've been working out. Well, 
just as our bodies change as we get older, our hair color changes, our skin changes, so does our memory. So there are some changes that are normal as we age. And we'll go over a couple of these items. First of all, as we mentioned with the, sun, with the glasses, we all lose our glasses or our keys or even our car from time to time. We walk, we rush into Winn-Dixie or Publix or Walmart or wherever we're going. We rush out and we realize, oh my gosh, where is my car? Where did I leave it? Has anybody else done, has anybody done that? Anybody here besides me? I'm gonna raise my hand, hi. <laughs> yes. A lot of times we're just not really paying attention. If we're walking in with a friend or we're on our phone or we're looking down at our phone texting these days, we're not focusing on where we parked our car. So you're not gonna remember something that you never really absorbed in. So you have to really think about it. Think about where you just park at the same side of the parking lot every single time you go there. Park in the back because the extra steps are good for your brain. So it's a win-win situation. You're far away from everybody. So we can retrace our steps. If I go to work tomorrow and I'm looking for those glasses I just had on, I should be able to think to myself and to recall and say, well, I know I had them last night when I was at the community center in Port St. Lucie somebody with dementia might not even remember being here at all. In fact, they may deny they were here if I brought it up tomorrow. Well, it's like, don't you remember you were there last night? Not a good question for somebody who's dealing with memory changes. So a person can't really retrace their steps. Uh, we all occasionally make a bad decision, but every so often, you know, we make a bad choice. But when there's a new pattern of really bad decisions, and one of the things that really troubles me is all the sweepstakes scams and the phone calls that are coming in, and I know I got that grandma call, and I don't have any grandkids, so I know it was a fake, but it's very hard for people as their brains change to discern between what is real and what is a scam. So that's something that changes. We all might have missed a monthly payment. We live in South Florida. We have company coming from out of town. They're coming. We stash the bills in a drawer and promptly forget all about them until we get the next bill that says past due payment. And you figure out what to do, how to fix it. But the person with dementia might not, they might throw the past due bills in the garbage. They just don't even think about it. They might pay the bill three or four times they might not pay at all, they might get their water turned off and they don't tell anybody and they don't know what to do about it. It is different. It is a different type of memory change. S um, forgetting words, but we are able to hold a conversation and understand others in conversation. With somebody with a memory loss disorder, they might know all the words, but they're not putting them into proper sentences anymore, or they're not able to really do a good job communicating verbally. I just want to point out that, does anybody have any idea what percentage of our communication is verbal? Any guesses? Come on, Patty, let's hear it. <laughs> Give me a number, any number, make sure it's really high. Oh, she's so close. <laughs> it's, it's really only, a lot of people typically answer that question with like 75% of our, of our communication is verbal. But Patty, because she's been educated at Port St. Lucie U, <laughs> guessed 20. Well, it's really 10%. And if you think about all the communication that goes on without saying one word, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to communicate. Our body language tells a lot. Our facial expression tells a lot. How we say what we say says a lot. For example, if I say, Patty, she's smiling. If I say, Patty, she's still smiling. <laughs> Can't get away with anything here. <laughs> But it, did you hear the change? It actually felt my, I felt my blood pressure going up. I can, you know, I'm going to make myself sick if I keep staying mad at Patty like that. So there is a lot of communication. If you think about if you've ever had a dog, or I know you've had a dog, you talked about it. Does that dog let you know when it wants to go out? Does the dog want, let you know when it wants a piece of your steak dinner? Well, does the dog speak English? 
how does he communicate? He doesn't know a word of English. How do you know? So think about communication and the importance of tone of voice and everything else. So forgetting the day, what year is it right now? I didn't hear anybody say 1975, so that's a good thing. It is 2021, and we should all know that in this room if our, if our brains are working properly. We might not know the date. I mean, we might not know that it's the 7th of July. Typically, we know it's July. We know it's summertime. We know that. Um, but a person with a memory loss disorder may be living in the past, and they honestly think it is 1965. So with the little mini mental status exams, when they ask, who's the president? If they say, who was president in 1965, anybody know? Was it Kennedy? Is that the year he got killed, assassinated? Johnson, so he took over when, after. So I like this, though, because if, if even you bring up a year in the 60s and somebody mentioned Kennedy, you live in definitely that's in the past. And that's a lot of times, but that will give you a little insight into what is going on in the brain and the thought process of the person with the memory changes. They are living in the past. So if you tell them something about their grown-up children, they aren't going to believe you because they're, it's 1965, so their kids weren't even born yet in their world. It's a lot about entering their world. So, um, so we don't forget the year. We, we know when that is. And occasionally forgetting names, that can be very normal. But we don't forget how many children we have. We don't forget that a parent is deceased. We don't forget things like that. We don't forget our children were married. We don't forget if they were divorced. Those are the things that stick with us. So it's a different type of memory change. Let's see, what do we have next here? Okay, here's a brain teaser for you. Anybody know who's at risk for getting dementia? Okay, I'll tell you. Anyone with a brain? I'm trying to, okay, look at that fancy curtains. Did you see that? <laughs> so impressed. Okay, so who's on the top left? Yep, President Ronald Reagan, he announced in 1994, that's the year I started in this field, and that's when I think Alzheimer's awareness took off. That was the start of really getting word out to people. Ronald Reagan, when he was testifying, remember how many times, well, most people here are too young, but he would used to say, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember, and you know what? He really, right, Pat, he really didn't remember. I'm sure he really didn't remember because Alzheimer's does not start overnight. He had it at that time, I'm sure. Estelle Getty, she actually had Lewy body disease. B. Smith is a model, and I think her and her husband owned a restaurant. She just recently died at age 70. She died in 2020. She had early onset Alzheimer's, which is when it starts before age 65. And for those who are really young, before they're able to collect Social Security, say you're in your late 50s and you're diagnosed with an Alzheimer's type of dementia, you are fast-tracked into Social Security disability payments, which you know, really helps the younger person who did expect to be working for many more years. Um, let's see, who else is up there? Robin Williams, he had Lewy body dementia. Pat Summit is a basketball coach, and she was diagnosed at age 59, passed away at age 64. Anybody know where she coached basketball? Oh, genius. Oh my gosh, I'm going home right now. <laughs> I can't teach this group anything. Okay, Glenn Campbell. I had a picture of him in the recent years, and nobody recognized him, so I had to put something, an album in there with his name on it when he was really looked like Glenn Campbell. Jack Hanna is one of the newer people that mentioned he has, is living with Alzheimer's disease. Bronson, Norman Rockwell, 
Jean Wilder, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks died of Alzheimer's in 2005. Tony Bennett on the lower right side. So dementia, different types of dementia, it crosses all lines. Anybody can get it. It doesn't matter what race, what ethnicity, if you're a male, female, or other pronouns. It doesn't matter your IQ. Anybody and everybody, the most intelligent people and the people who have had no schooling, everybody can get dementia. Well, the Donna, if I may, yes. the question from the audience is, what is the youngest age that Donna is aware of um, of someone um, uh, getting um, Alzheimer's dementia? Is that fair? Thank you. The youngest age, I personally met a gentleman who was 40 years old. And I asked him about that when how he felt. And he said he really wasn't surprised. He was a pilot. He was well-educated. and. He said his father had younger onset Alzheimer's disease, and there is more of a genetic link in the younger, allset, younger onset, or the early onset. So 40 is the youngest, but I've met numerous people in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And later in the presentation, we talk about how age, at age 85, it's almost one in two. So age happens to be the biggest risk factor, but it is, it's more uncommon for it to happen in their 40s, 50s, 60s. In fact, Alzheimer's has been around for over 100 years. Dr. Alois Alzheimer in Germany is the person who first had a patient, Augusta D, with Alzheimer's disease. And when she passed away, she was, she, I think she was only in her 50s or early 60s when she passed away, but when he looked at her brain, he saw these goopy little plaques and tangles in her brain, and that's when it was named. He wrote the article for the journal, and it was Alzheimer's disease since then, and that was since 1906. Um, one of the things that I always wondered, well, if it was around since over 100 years, why didn't we hear about it? When I grew up, it was hardening the arteries or senility, or things like that. We never, ever, ever heard the word Alzheimer's disease. Now we hear it every day on TV, on different commercials. Well, one of the doctors who at the time was probably in his 60s said when he went to school, it was still taught the way Dr. Alois Alzheimer wrote it up. This is a rare disease that happens in young people. Still 100% true. It's more rare to happen if somebody's under age 65. But think about it. What they didn't know back then was how common it is as people age, because how old were people typically when they passed away at the turn of the century in 1906 and 1910? Were they living like they are today until their 80s, 90s, and 100s? That was rare. So that's why it was written up and studied. Now we have learned, we've learned so much over the years. When I first started in 94, we didn't even have any genetic links. Now we have several. So there's a lot that's going on. You might not think any progress is being made, but it absolutely is, and it's happening worldwide. Everybody's desperate for a cure and a cause. So we talked about some people who had Alzheimer's or Lewy body or related dementia. Let's real quickly talk about the 10 warning signs. Short-term memory loss is the hallmark symptom, but it's short-term memory loss that disrupts daily living. So it's a little bit different than just forgetting something here and there. It's a little different from going into the garage and thinking, oh my gosh, what did I come here for? It's starting, right? But then you go right back to where you were and you realize, oh yes, I needed the screwdriver to take this picture frame apart. It comes right back to you. But it's short-term memory loss. I've had people say, because I'm with Honor Flight, we have worked with lots of World War II veterans. In fact, your husband is a Right, Barb, your husband was a World War II veteran. Yes. So um, they've said, oh, he's, he's doing really good. He just doesn't remember what he had for breakfast or what he did last night. And it's like, but he remembers World War II perfectly. But that, to me, it's like, uh, that's not OK that people are forgetting what they had or that they ate breakfast, just even if it was a few minutes ago. So there's a little bit of, you know, it's a difference. Challenges in planning or solving problems. We all probably were aware of, of ELSA this past weekend 
was going to be out there somewhere. Tropical storm, hurricane, she did all kinds of different things. We all know we're supposed to plan. We're supposed to have water. We're supposed to have batteries. We're not supposed to wait until the last minute. And heaven forbid you need plywood at, at Lowe's or Home Depot right now because of the prices, right? With, with after COVID, everything's gone sky high. But we know how to plan and we know how to take care of those things. A person with dementia will hear about that and it might even be approaching us and just not do anything not prep the house, not do anything, because they don't have that follow through. Difficulty, number three is difficulty completing familiar tasks. And that is somebody who always used to balance their checkbook to the penny. And now they've bounced a couple of checks and I was like, that is not normal for her. Now if, if you have somebody who always bounced checks, that's not a change, that's just them. But the person who was really particular to the penny and everything else. That's a change, so that's number three. Or the man who was always really handy. He could take anything apart and put it back together. The lawnmower, the you, this and that. Well, now the lawnmower's been in pieces in the garage for the past six months. And that's not him. That's not normal for him. Those are that type of change. Confusion with time or place. If you don't know today that you're in Port St. Lucie, Florida, that could be, a, I'm not saying you have dementia, but I'm saying I would wonder why wouldn't you know that you're in Port St. Lucie? Or if you have a one-story house and you want to go upstairs and go to bed at night, that might be because you're from the Northeast where all the houses always had a second floor and everybody always went upstairs. That type of thing, you're living in the past. There's subtle little changes. But not knowing where you are or the year is one of the warning signs, and it's not just one little thing. It's a combination of things, and it's a pattern. So number five is trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. And that's even, if you think about how, what it's like to drive a car, you have to know when to stop your car. You have to know how to stay in your lane. You have to know the distance between the car in front of you and how close to the curb. That's your spatial relationship. Um, you have to know if you want to walk. I, one of the guys that we used to work with who had younger onset Alzheimer's, he was walking towards a door and he misjudged it. His brain told him the door opening was here, but it wasn't. And he smacked into it and hurt himself. He didn't realize that the eyes and the brain aren't connecting the way that they should. If there's new problems, with words and speaking or writing. Say you have somebody who used to write the most beautiful notes on birthday cards and now they can barely sign their name. That's a change. Somebody who could always converse very well and now it's m just mumbling and the words don't make sense and it's word salad and it's just all over the place. That would be a red flag. We already talked about number seven which is misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps. Um, decreased or poor judgment, that could be, we've had people that have actually lost their life savings because they made some poor financial decisions. So somebody, that's often the first time we'll see that there are problems when there are financial issues or something's not getting paid or your taxes aren't getting paid, things like that might pop up. Um, withdrawal from work or social activities, I really and truly feel that people tend to withdraw because on some level they have an awareness that something is wrong and they don't want to embarrass themselves. So a lot of times if you p see people start to isolate or kind of bring their world in and not hang out with the family, I mean I've seen it on both sides of my family, but I had one aunt who she used to always be outgoing and happy to be in the crowd of all the relatives or she was withdrawing more and more and not having conversations and just kind of staying to herself. That was a big change and she had Alzheimer's from before Hurricane Andrew, which was 1992 till 2013. Long time. Changes in mood, yes, you have a question. Do you want to say that, Pat? Yes, we're going to wait for that question until after number 10 from yeah. Ms. True. Yes, thank you. Changes in mood or personality. This doesn't always happen. You might see somebody who gets a little bit gnarly and nasty and like impatient and frustrated. 
But what I've seen more is people getting nicer. I can't tell you how many adult daughters have said, my mom is so nice now that she has Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's like, oh, that's fantastic. So there can be changes for the good as well as some negative things. But in terms, a lot of people associate Alzheimer's with violence. In doing this since 1994, I don't even have one handful of people that got violent. Not even one handful that I could name. And most of the time what happens is people can get very frustrated because the people around them are not educated and the people around them are trying to correct them and they're trying and are basically hurting the feelings. They get frustrated and with a little bit of education and support and help, we can change that. We can make that world so much better for both the caregiver or the care partner and the person with the memory changes. So all of these are on the Alzheimer's Association website. They're really renowned for their statistics and their facts. They have all the numbers, all the facts, but alz.org, very easy. And they also have a 24-7 helpline. So they are available nationally to anybody who needs help anytime round the clock. I think it's important that you know a resource that's available to you round the clock. So, dementia, when you looked at all those 10 warning signs, you might start thinking, oh, I see that, and I see this, and I see this. Well, it's, dementia is only one of the reasons for these unusual changes or behaviors. There could be so many other things going on, but when you, got, you came here to become educated or you're being proactive, and we can also always figure out where or how you can get a free memory screening. I used to work with the uh, Memory Disorder Center, and we would schedule the memory screenings at various places, St. Lucie West Boulevard. We'd be all over the place. Now, I mean, people come into Brain Matters Research at our, on our campus at the Kane Center if they'd like. By appointment, we can do a free screening for you. There's a lot of things that can be done in advance by being proactive. It's good to get a baseline. So, one of my most common questions is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Does it start out as dementia and become Alzheimer's? No, it was, actually always it was actually always Alzheimer's, but they might have called it dementia. Now, why would they do that? Dementia is this umbrella term. Dementia means short-term memory loss, basically, that affects daily living. If a doctor tells somebody in your family that they have dementia, your next question is going to be, what do you think is the cause of the dementia? And if the doctor says, I don't know, that's okay. I think I would like that doctor because he's being very realistic. He's gonna say, let's do some blood work. Let's check the B12. Let's check the thyroid. Let's do an MRI. Let's see if it's a brain tumor. Let's rule out anything that could possibly be treated. So it might be that they called it dementia because they see that's only the symptoms, short-term memory loss that affects daily living. But what is the cause? You have to get to the cause. So as I mentioned before, at age 85, it's almost one in two. But remember, that means that's one in two that are healthy. So that's a lot of people. And there's so many different disorders and causes. And most people notice these subtle changes long before a diagnosis is made, especially with Alzheimer's, because the onset of Alzheimer's is slow, insidious, sneaks up on people. It doesn't happen overnight. If somebody has a major stroke, dementia can happen overnight. But Alzheimer's doesn't. It's kind of tiptoes in. I didn't know if you were going to say something. Okay, so let's get to say, what is Alzheimer's? It's the most common cause of dementia. It is irreversible. The good thing is that even though it's not reversible, you're going to have good days and bad days. You're going to have a, you know, most likely a very slow, steady, downhill decline. But there's going to be good days, and that's what we focus on, the good days, the moments of joy. That is the important thing. You, you get educated so you can cope and prepare. But the other types of dementia might be vascular when there's heart issues or when high blood pressure, somebody has high blood pressure, diabetes, all those factors. 
have an influence. Frontal temporal disorders is often not so much the short-term memory changes as much as a change in behaviors and people who say what they see. Outcomes, whatever they're thinking with no filters. And I know there's a lot of times well, if I might look at somebody's outfit and say, oh man, that outfit, it looks horrible on them. Why would they wear that? But I would not say that out loud. I've learned not to do that. Right? But somebody with a frontal temporal disorder could say very inappropriate comment, or they would just say it. They would just come out and say it, and that's not going to go over too big with people. We, Louis body dementia was named after Dr. Louis, who worked in Germany around the same time as Dr. Alois Alzheimer. Um, but Louis body kind of looks like a combination of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. So you have a little bit of stiffness, but you, you have a sleep disorder as well with Louis body dementia. People are basically, they can be acting out their dreams. Um, the, if you've seen the movie Concussion, that talked about CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy. Say that with me, encephalopathy. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? Are you proud of me? I think I did it right, maybe? I don't know, maybe I didn't. Any nurses in the room, any doctors in the room? Oh, thank goodness. Phew, okay, so, but that is from all those repeated hits to the head. Boxers, fighters, uh, football players, you know, this, they all, it's a risk. But there are reversible causes of memory changes, such as medications. And different medications affect uh, people differently. So your neighbor might take something and it doesn't affect her at all, and you start on it, and your memory just all of a sudden, it's like, boy, oh, my memory has changed. But it could be the medication. It's just affecting you that way. Urinary tract infections. Especially when we see a change in somebody who's known to have some type of dementia, if we see a change in their behavior, male or female, first thing we're going to ask is check the medical. Do they have a UTI, a urinary tract infection? Get that checked first because that can often lead to behaviors. They don't have the same symptoms or the same pain as we might when we were younger, and they might not be able to say what's going on. And we have seen people get hospitalized because they haven't looked into the UTI. And once they're treated, they do better. And vitamin deficiencies, sleep deprivation. We've, had a, we've tested with the memory screening, we've tested a lot of younger professionals who are very worried because they're very aware of Alzheimer's disease and they got tested. And it was really lack of sleep, lack of proper nutrition, things like that, depression can cause a dementia that looks just like Alzheimer's. And also chronic, long-term alcohol abuse can cause a type of dementia. But it's not Alzheimer's, it's not the goopy little plaques and tangles in the brain. Can you tell I'm not a nurse, I'm a social worker? You know, <laughs> it's very medical terminology I use. So let's look at what the brain, how the brain changes. Look at that brain on the right, look at the difference. There is shrinkage. You see big changes. Look at those like little the folds. The brain weighs less. A lot of brain cells have died with Alzheimer's disease. So there is a change in the brain. I'm gonna show you a couple more pictures. So this on the left, if you take the top of the head and look down, if you're looking at the brain on the bottom, what are your expectations going to be of that person? You know, you might have somebody who's 75 or 80 years old and they're out playing tennis every day or playing golf every day. They're really physically fit, but they don't remember to put the garbage out. They don't remember where they put their keys. They don't remember this. They don't remember that. Well, if the brain looks like the brain on the bottom, time for you to rethink your expectations and think about what can they do if their brain looks like that. Uh, you see the difference on both slides. So, for those of you who like statistics, anybody like statistics? All right, we at least have one, two, oh good. Good, we have some people, good, I like it. You know, as I was going through my old notes to make sure I was, you know, including everything here that I wanted to today, I noticed when I was doing this, same type of presentation in 2005, which is 16 years ago, 
there were 4.5 million Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, 6 million that we know of. We always know these numbers are low because many people just say, oh, what do you expect, he's 85. You know, what do you expect, he's 90. He's forgetting some things, but that's not the way it always works. So, in St. Lucie County, roughly 7,000 that we know of. In 2018, it's just what's on the Department of Elder Affairs website. That's the latest we have the numbers for. So we know it's gone up since then. Not everybody's even informed of their diagnosis. They're not told that they have Alzheimer's disease. The projection is a costly one, about 13 million by 2050, which is 30 years from now. Florida has roughly 580,000 people. And although there is much research going on around the entire world, and the whole world is researching, we don't know the cure yet. Later on this month, I believe there is a big gathering of the medical, the doctors, the researchers. It takes place once a year. It's hosted by the Alzheimer's Association. So it's about the time that you'll start seeing little blurbs in the newspaper about different things they've discovered or that what they've learned through their research. And most likely, it'll be about the newest medication that was approved. Part of that should be included. But let's look at aging in America, since you have some people that like the numbers. OK. Think about this. Baby boomers were born between 46 and 64. There are 76 to 78 million of us, and we all started turning, we started turning 65 in 2011, which means we're gonna start turning age 85 10 years from now. That means half of the people that turn 85 are going to have Alzheimer's or a related dementia. I mean, you think about those numbers and how it's going to add up. That is, Alzheimer's happens to be one of the most costly diseases to Medi you know, for Medicare. So the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, does consider Alzheimer's to be a public health crisis most expensive disease in the USA. At age 65, we talked about age 85, but at age 65, it's roughly one in 10 who have Alzheimer's or a related dementia. More women than men. African Americans are twice more likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementia, and Hispanics are one and a half times more likely. And we say, why is that? And we may not really know, but one of the factors could be Diet, nutrition could be a contributing factor, but we're not really there yet in terms of research. That's why we need research, so we can figure out why and what and how to stop it and how to prevent it and how to make it better. So, is anybody here dealing with somebody who has memory changes or memory loss and want to know what the heck do I do every day? You know, I don't care about these statistics. I want to know what to do when I go home and my mother doesn't remember who I am or doesn't remember that I told her I was going to this university class tonight at Port St. Lucie, right? So let's get into that. I want you to really always picture those brains that I showed you and always think about expectations and how could you expect somebody without the healthy brain to do the things that they always did or do the things properly. And when you say, don't you remember? If I say to somebody who has a memory loss disorder, remember, I told you. Oh, come on. You're the one who needs to change that tune because guess what? No. Why do you expect somebody with a short-term memory loss disorder to remember something you told them, even if you told them 10 times? It's not sticking. So here's some communication tips. If you approach somebody from the back, you could startle them, and guess what? When you get startled, kapow. Somebody might hit at you or strike out at you to protect themselves because you have startled them. So you want to approach people from the front. You want to maintain eye contact. You want to remove distractions. If TV is blaring over here because they're hard of hearing and it's up really loud, you want to think about that. If the doorbell's ringing, all, all these different things are going on at the same time. Remove the distractions. Turn the TV down. 
be careful not to interrupt people if they're talking. Be patient. And yes, you might have to wait a little bit longer because they might be slow in getting the message out. And that's okay. It's not their fault. Their brain is changing. Yours isn't. So you can, you're the one who really has to do some changing, as difficult as that sounds. But we help you with that. So don't argue with their reality. If I say to Patty, I love your yellow jacket. Anybody in the audience is going to look at me like, whoa, she's colorblind because Patty definitely has a red jacket. No, I'm only kidding. She definitely has a blue jacket on, right? But in, I'm in the real world. The person with the memory loss changes may just have chosen the wrong word. Big deal. Let it go. Don't argue, don't correct. Now, if you're going to the doctor's office and the doctor needs facts, have you fallen recently? If, if they say no and you watched them fall earlier this morning, that you can, you have to let the doctor know. They're not what's called a reliable reporter. You might not get the facts. But when you're at home and something like that comes up, let it go. So, it's, their reality is often different from yours. Be calm, be supportive, as much as you can. All of these things are much easier said than done, and I understand that. I've dealt with it personally. So it's okay, and we as humans are going to lose our patience and we're going to make mistakes, but guess what? The person with memory loss is going to forget that, and we're gonna be better because we have more awareness now, and we are tuned in, and we're gonna make it better each time we mess up. So again, consider your tone of voice and body language. Usually I do a demonstration, but with the cameras, um, I'm, I don't, I know I'm not going to wander too far away from the microphone. Um, do not talk down to somebody with dementia because people with dementia are not stupid. They are, they can still be extremely brilliant. They just can't remember things and that's okay. They're still genius. Don't talk down to them. Speak slowly, clearly. It's better to break down the questions. Keep it simple, as simple as possible. And even if you're helping somebody get dressed, instead of having them go to the closet to pick out an outfit or all those clothes in there, take two things out. You want to wear the blue shirt or the green shirt today and hold them up so they can see and help make that decision and feel empowered. Don't speak about the person as if they're not there. And even if they seem advanced in their Alzheimer's, a lot of times they absolutely get and understand every word you're saying and always talk as if they do. Whether they do or they don't, always talk as if they do and treat people with dignity and respect. The next slide. Has anybody ever heard this term, anastognosia? Big fancy word, all that means is lack of insight. What I've heard over the years is a spouse will say to me, you know the doctor told him or her they have, de they have Alzheimer's, they won't do this, they won't do that, they won't, you know, they deny it, they deny it, they deny it. Well, guess what, it might not actually be denial. It could be anosognosia because the cells in the brain have changed just enough where it takes away their ability to see what's going on. And that's what I hear a lot. It's like, um, yeah, he says he doesn't have any problems with his memory, but he went to Publix last night and bought 10 cans of cat food, and we haven't had a cat in 20 years. You know, that type of thing. But they deny it. There's nothing going on with them. That's okay. They can deny it. You need to learn the new dance and song and make sure they're safe and make sure you get some things lined up, including a good medical evaluation, a good workup done to figure out what is going on and is it reversible. Don't ever assume if there's memory changes that it's Alzheimer's disease, because it might not be. It might be something that can be helped. So when people have that, um, we learn a different dance, how to dance around that. People present very well for a short period of time. It's company manners. Somebody comes to visit, your spouse has been giving you a hard time all morning. Somebody shows up at the door and they are just as charming and sweet as can be and they're wondering about 
you the caregiver like he's really good wow and you're like oh you live with him for 24 hours or 48 hours right anybody been through that it's like yes they pulled together for a short period of time just like the kids did i know my mom used to say well, you know, the neighbor said, you're so sweet. Why don't you act like that when you're at home? Because when we're at home, we let our hair down. It's the real us. Well, the real us comes out. So we're just going to be who we are. But company manners really can be a good thing. We already talked about reliable reporter. You don't really know if it's true. Somebody says somebody stole something from them. And I'm sure that with the police department right across the street, I am sure they've gotten more than a few calls about neighbors stealing somebody's things but the person actually had dementia and it wasn't true but it could be true we we have to check it out it could be true so the process to diagnose the cause of the dementia is complex and typically we would recommend a neurologist a neuropsychologist a neuropsychiatrist most people the neurologists are the most common doctors that people would see and you have several right here in Port St. Lucie. You have numerous doctors, and we can always help you. The Alzheimer's Association can help you. There's a lot of groups that will help you find that right type of doctor who can help figure out what is going on. Here's a little bit of food for thought. If you have somebody in your family or nearby or a neighbor, the person with dementia is not giving you a hard time. I've had many people say they're feel they're being manipulated. They don't, you know, they don't really they seem like they're putting on an act. But these people with memory changes are struggling. Nobody fakes dementia. They are struggling. They are having a really really hard time and they're doing the best that they can. And it's a matter of acceptance on your part and making sure that everything is safe. And I mean in reality, I want to see people get their legal documents taken care of, the powers of attorney, get a durable power of attorney done early so that make your wishes clear so that everybody around you knows what you want down the road if you can't make that decision for yourself. So what do we do? How do we take care of ourselves? First of all, exercise happens to be one of the biggest things you can do for your brain. It's researched. Yeah, exercise. How dull. Wait, what do you have right here? A fabulous place that, yes, yeah, see, you can exercise right here. And I know when we used to have different meetings here, there was always a lot of people on the treadmills in that room. This was before COVID. There was always so much activity. So you have things right here. If you got here tonight, you can get back here to exercise. How's that? Good? Okay, good. So if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain parking a little bit further away. If you're okay with walking, if your doctor says you should exercise, don't take the front row. Park further in the back. Walk. Get those extra steps in. Socialization, believe it or not, is researched to be good for the brain. That's why COVID has affected you. had mentioned somebody who came out and went to, the, is it, was it yoga they went to? They had not been out of their house in all that time. That affects the brain. So that socialization makes a big difference for people. And we saw with our, we had to close our daycare center for a little bit, and we did see the changes in people. Good nutrition. Yeah. Good nutrition, blueberries, food that are rich in antioxidants, less red meat. You know, the, the Mediterranean style of diet is going to be good. Lots of greens, salads, less red meat. All, you know, all of our favorite things. But personally, my idea of a balanced diet is a cookie in each hand. <laughs> That's what I would really have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, I want you to think about going off autopilot. What does that mean? It means if you have something on your left wrist, you do, Barb, you have a watch, or put it on your right hand. Put yours on your right hand and see what happens. See how many times you look to see what time it is on the hand that you normally have it on. But you're off autopilot, so guess what? You're using your brain in a different way because you're not on autopilot anymore. That's why travel is good. Here at home, we're like the same road every day, back and forth. Go to Winn-Dixie, go to Publix, go to you know wherever you're going. Go to here to work out. 
But when you travel, you have to rethink things. You don't know where you're going necessarily, so you've got to come up with a whole new plan, and it's good for your brain. So when you go home tonight and you brush your teeth, instead of doing it, if you normally brush your teeth with your, whichever hand is dominant, whether that's right or left, do it with the opposite hand. Promise me you're going to do this. Are you going to remember to go home and do this? When you, if you don't have a car with a smart key, you can't do it if you have a smart key because your car unlocks. But if you have a key for your door to the car or the house, open it with your non-dominant hand and see how uncomfortable that is. <laughs> but you can do it, and it's good for your brain. You're going off autopilot. Can't beat that. Okay, here's a quiz. If a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, they can no longer execute a durable power of attorney. Is that true, my last name, or false? Thank you, very false. Because there's many, 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 many stages of Alzheimer's disease, and it does not mean you are immediately, legally incompetent or incapacitated. So, but get those things done ASAP. Okay, another little quiz question. When a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, they lose the right to drive in the state of Florida. True or false? The doctors? Yes, the doctors. Yeah. One, one lady said um, uh, they are, the doctor is allowing them to drive. So the answer? The answer is that is false. You do not lose your driver's license in anywhere, really. You are allowed to drive, but is it safe? And one of our little informal tests is if you have grandchildren, would you let your grandchildren ride with that person? If you say, oh, no way, then they shouldn't be on the road. If it takes two people to be in the car, you m they probably shouldn't be driving. But there's also some of the neurologists have these wonderful tests that they can do to test cognition because when you think about it, you better have not only have good reflexes to stop in case you need to, but to judge all the distances and to all the things that are part of driving, turning your lights on, do you remember how to do it? A lot of times when somebody with Alzheimer's gets a new car, that's when their driving stops because they can't learn new things and it is too hard to learn how to drive a new car. But if you take their driver's license away, does that mean they're going to stop driving? Yeah, you hope so, but guess what? Absolutely not. Their mind is not thinking the same way, so just because they've lost their driver's license, I'm trying to look at my clock, make sure I didn't run out of time yet. Um, they could drive, so we usually have people somehow lock the car, put a club on the drive, the steering wheel, or something like that, where they can't drive or make the car disappear. And I have a magic wand. You want to see the car disappear? There you go. You didn't know I actually had a magic wand, did you? <laughs> okay, so this is a very important number. Notice the word if there is suspected abuse, neglect, self-neglect. You have a neighbor who's not taking care of themselves, something's wrong. They, you know their power is out, you know their water is off. If you suspect that, if you expect exploitation, somebody's taking their money, a family member or anything else, call state Adult Protective Services, 1-800-96-ABUSE, and let them decide whether they should accept that case or not. They don't always take the case, but that is your responsibility. Let's get into some local resources. Right here in Port St. Lucie, we have the Council on Aging of St. Lucie. That is right here. It's on Bayshore. If you go towards the turnpike, you just keep going past. Don't get on the turnpike. Go straight down Bayshore. It's on your left. They're fabulous. They do a wonderful job. Council on Aging of St. Lucie County. If you need some services and you can't really afford services, who are you going to call? You start with up on the top. Area Agency on Aging, your Aging and Disability Resource Center, Call this number, 
866-684-5885. They will get some basic information from you, and then they're going to call you back for an interview and get more detailed information and either put you on the waiting list or get your services started. That is how to get sliding scale. If you live in St. Lucie County, Council on Aging of St. Lucie will be the ones just dispensing the services. If you're in Martin County, it's us, the Council on Aging of Martin County. If you want to know what Martin County HUGS is, HUGS actually stands for Help, Understanding, Guidance, and Safety. We've passed around a book. This handbook was just printed on July 24th. It's really actually hot off the press. The lady on the cover is a resident, a local resident, and we have several other people. They're all from Martin County. This is a way to make all of our county dementia friendly, something that can easily be done here in St. Lucie County as well. 211 is available 24-7. If you have somebody you're worried about, you want to know about services, it might be kids, it might be somebody, even if somebody's suicidal, you can call 211. They are staffed 24-7. These are good numbers that you can use, and I mentioned the Alzheimer's Association has a 24-7 helpline that you can call 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4th of July, doesn't matter, call them. Any questions? Silence. Yes, did, some, did you raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> Anybody have any questions or comments or? There is one question um, from Zoom uh, asking, can I have information on specialists in the Port St. Lucie area for screening? Okay, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think of the free memory screenings. And I'm not sure there are any free memory screenings. The reason you might be able to have the Memory Disorder Center come here. You might be able to have somebody from Brain Matters Research come here. And if you have a community that has, you have a bunch of people you'd like to see screened, they might be able to work that out with you. But like we have it at the Kane Center all the time with Brain Matters Research by appointment. You don't have any research such as that at this point in St. Lucie County. But you can call me. You can call, is the number up there? 223-7800. You can call me if you'd like and we'll figure it out. We'll get you some help. We'll figure out how to get you a free screening. Okay? Thank you, thank you very much, Donna. Does that help the inquirer online on Zoom, via Zoom? Appears to be so, so thank you for answering that, for responding. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I'll rephrase that, or I'll repeat the question, I'm sorry. Since, since there is no cure for Alzheimer's, um, given that there's medication for it, does the medication help or does it regress? Is that the question, ma'am? How effective is the medication so it doesn't uh, continue to spread? Oh, if it's Alzheimer's disease, it is slowly going to get worse over time, regardless of any medication, because we don't yet know how to really fully stop the progress. But if you think about the normal decline, I mentioned is a slow, steady downhill decline, but some of the medications, especially if you get on them earlier, they might be, the decline might be at this level, so you're gonna stay higher functioning for a longer period of time. The thing is with most of the medications, I would say the majority of people do not see an improvement. Like if you have a headache, you take an aspirin, the headache goes away. That's not typically the way it works with an Alzheimer's medication, such as Aricep, Exelon, Nemenda, Nemzeric, those are all the, the, the real names, not the generic names. Um, it might slow down what appears to be the progression, but it might keep them functioning higher for a longer period of time, and that is very important. It's a personal choice. 
And a lot of people say, well, they've been on it for a few years, so I keep them on it. The doctors, even the doctors, when you speak to the doctors, they'll all have different opinions, but research, you know, you might see improvement in maybe 25 where they actually go from this level up. But if I had a loved one right now that especially in the earlier stage, I would definitely consider the medication. That's my personal opinion. Because I want them to stay as high functioning as they can for as long as they can. You think it helped, Pat? Thank you. Thank you for that. One lady shared that she thinks that the medication did help her husband. for about four years, so he's really maintaining. And that's a lot of people who do research as well. They feel that they'll be able to maintain at a higher level. That's how the Biogen thing, the whole thing started mm -hmm. with research and people felt that was helping. Did that help at all? It's such a tough decision because there's no like, there's no perfect answer like, yes, get on the medication and it's magically gonna go away. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, but it helps. A lot of it is learning how to change as the care partners mm -hmm. and the caregivers and how to make your life, because it's very, very important for you to take care of yourselves as well. If you're a caregiver or a care partner, it is really crucial. We have to figure out, you know, if you need a support group, our support groups actually, we had two today, and they're virtual right now, they're on Zoom, so people from St. Lucie are more than welcome to join. They don't have to drive to Stewart. But there are support groups, a lot of support groups throughout the area, and there's a lot of help in our community. Yes. <laughs> the the ladies, did you want to refer? You, go ahead, Donna. Oh. The uh, person here asked if people start making up stories, are they living in their own fantasy world, or are they going back in time? Do they make up stories? Yes. A lot of times, they absolutely make up really good stories, too, and they claim it's true. We have people that have sworn they served in the war, but in actuality, they just watched a war movie on TV. So they're mixing up what they've seen on TV with their real life, and they incorporate it as their own story. I've had so many people, like the daughters would call me and say, Mom is just lying about these things. It's not true. It never happened. And the reality is, she's just doing to the best of her ability. Mom is not lying. She, she does think it's true, but it's not. Um, but, oh, making up stories, it happens very frequently because they can't remember the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So sometimes you just listen and try and get, well, could that have been real? Is that a part of her history? Did something really happen? But I love the question because it is very, very common. Yes. Yes. You asked, she asked, what do the medications specifically target? Aricept and Exelon, are, it has to do with acetylcholine in the brain, so it's brain chemicals. Um, Nemenda is the NMDA receptors in the brain. Nemzeric is a combination of Aricept, which is acetylcholine, and Nemenda, which is the NMDA. So they all try to work in different ways. And the newest one, Adjuhelm, which is going to be an infusion, or is an infusion, that clears out amyloid in the brain, but it's not necessarily taking away the Alzheimer's. You know, it is helping with the amyloid. The newest one, or I don't know yet on that one. On, on the newest one, but I think we'll get more information on that real soon this month when the researchers all gather. Um, the, 
The question was the newest medication. Are they going to keep it under research or are they going to make it available? Well, it's approved by the FDA, so that will be it's supposed to become available. It's just now they have to figure out how to do this because how many doctor's offices are set up to do infusions? And it's not a quick process. It doesn't happen in a minute. You pop a pill and you're done. So there, you know, there's going to be different steps that have to be taken to prepare for that. Very expensive. It was like 50 something thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. But there's going, you know, the drug company said there's going to be help with that. So. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I was in the chat box instead of the. All right. Should, here's a question from the Zoom audience Should a PCP prescribe the medication or a specialist? Sometimes PCPs, primary care physicians, will prescribe the medication. I would want to just make sure that whoever is prescribing has done a very good workup, including, like I said, blood work. I mean, you basically, you want to check for a B12 deficiency. You want to check for thyroid issues. You want to check for strokes. You want to check for seizures. You want to check for brain tumors. You, you don't want somebody just say, well, they're 85, it's probably Alzheimer's. Here's some Aricept. I don't want that. If it's my loved one, in fact, I told my own mom, mom, she was forgetting things like, mom, please ask your doctor to at least do some blood work, check your B12. And I was like, oh, please let it be B12. Came back, she goes, Donna, my B12 is good. He checked it. And then about a few weeks later, I forgot something and I told her I forgot something. She goes, Donna, maybe you should get your B12 checked. <laughs> <laughs> so she caught me a few times. But yes, so no, they can prescribe it, absolutely, but did they do the rest of the workup? Did they make sure it's not something that's treatable? And yes, I saw another hand. Yes. You, can you Will the Aricept the, and the yeah. to help with stroke? <laughs> I, it's, it hasn't been, not, that I know of has not been research for stroke, but what happens? A lot of times people have both. Like we have brain banks in the state of Florida and people actually donate their brains. They wanna know, okay, what was really going on? Did they have Alzheimer's disease? The only way to be 100% sure is still autopsy, even though we have PET scans that can detect amyloid in the brain now. So what, you, what, they've normal, what they often see is a mixture of Alzheimer's disease and vascular changes such as a stroke. So would you treat that? It might help with the amyloid if they have the amyloid in the brain from Alzheimer's. It's a really tough question, but it was completely just stroke. I don't know that it's been researched for that. But how do we know? Pat. So um, somebody in the audience is saying her husband had this very specialized PET scan. Um, did they find amyloid in the brain? So they found amyloid. Okay. So she, they found amyloid in the brain, which, but his behaviors, he's maintaining, he's stable. So that's a, that's a good thing. That's, we're not totally there yet with research. That's why we need to do more and more research all over, but this, this PET scan that came out, it was a trial for quite a while that Medicare was going to cover for a short period of time, and then they, I don't know, they haven't yet approved it. We had somebody who actually funded some, uh, some of them to be covered at our, at our day medical center at the Kane Center, but I don't know if there's still any funding for that, but Medicare doesn't pay, and it costs like $6,000, something like that, I'm told. Rumor has it, several thousand dollars. So a lot of people don't get it done because Medicare doesn't cover the cost. Who else has a question or comment or yes?
Well, when you say memory care, tell me more about what you mean because I'm Yeah. Sometimes memory care might be the facility, like an assisted living facility that has a memory care unit, and there's lots of them. Um, the Kane Center, we have all kinds of activities for active adults, and we have exercise classes every day, and we have card players, and we have our daycare. We do, we actually send out over 500 Meals on Wheels every single day. That Oh uh, yes, St. Lucie County people can attend, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So memory care, oftentimes when I hear it, it's about the type of care offered in an assisted living facility because there is dementia specific, there's memory care, it's secure, they have sta good staffing that know how to work with people with memory changes. Yes, ma'am. Memory care? No. When with the memory care that we're talking about in facilities is there is definitely a cost to that. Everybody's different, but it would be several thousand dollars a month. The good thing is, as I mentioned, area agency, above on the top right, your Aging and Disability Resource Center, they have some programs that help. They have some programs that help with assisted living. Medicaid has some programs that help with nursing home care to help cover the cost. So never let cost be a stumbling block. Call them and find out, is there help for this? Where can I get help? If you need daycare, um, we have daycare in Martin County, but you have several daycare centers here in Port St. Lucie run by Council on Aging of St. Lucie County, run by Alzheimer's Community Care. They do a fabulous job and don't let yourself go without resources. And if I can help in any way, I am more than happy to help. You can call me at the Kane Center, the 223-7800 number. But you can call your Council on Aging here. You can call Elder Helpline. There's help in our community. Yes. We're talking about nutrition being good for the brain, and what about when somebody craves one particular food item? I can't really explain that. It's, it's hard to explain the changes in the brain. I, I've seen that a few times with the frontal temporal type of dementia, where the, the changes are in the front part of the brain, and they stay focused on that one, one food, like they have to go to McDonald's every day and get a a cheeseburger or an Egg McMuffin or something like that, but I, I'm sorry, but I can't really explain how or why. I think it might be a losing battle if they're insisting on that food. But you, you know, if you're not getting the proper nutrition, you know, maybe a type of milkshake, like an Ensure type of milkshake, something like that, that at least enhances the nutritional intake would be important. Sometimes you have to get pretty creative and come up with all different kinds of ways. And hydration is something that's often overlooked. We have to hydrate lots of water or foods that contain water, lettuce and popsicles and watermelon and things like that are you know, going to provide that. Yes, ma'am. That would, they would both, stroke would be one of the vascular causes of dementia. When it's stroke or heart issues, or high blood pressure, they're all tied into the vascular system, the blood and the oxygen getting to the brain, to the heart, to all the other organs. So they'll be able to do a lot of different testing to determine, and they can see if there are strokes with some of the different testing that they do. So when there are vascular changes, it impedes the flow of blood to the brain, that's when you're going to see some changes. That's when you're going to see some cells die, brain cells die. So 
That, I don't know if a stent could have caused a vascular episode. I don't know, um, being that I'm not in the medical field, I, I don't know. I know anesthesia, I've heard about things with anesthesia seeming to change things for people where they seem to be a little worse if they needed a major surgery and had to have anesthesia. Trying to think who would have the answers for you, other and you know, hopefully your doctor would be able to answer that. But all those things, it's all you know. You think about the brain and what it can do, and how important it is that we have um, good blood flow and good nutrition, and all those components all play a role. All right, everyone, thank you so much for all your great questions. We're not done yet, but I would like to ask right now, especially for those in person, can we take a moment and give a, a really round, great round of applause to Donna Trana True, please. And that was so informative. I'll go off camera now. If anybody needs a robotic pet like this one, I have him turned off so he doesn't, didn't bark all the way through my demonstration, my presentation. Department of Elder Affairs, at the start of COVID, decided they wanted to give these robotic pets, dogs and cats, a bark, they move, he's got a little, his little heart beats. And if you have somebody who likes things like this, the dog or the cat, they're actually valued at over $100. And Department of, if you go to elderaffairs.org, you can order one, no strings attached. Simply Elder Affairs, E L D E R A F F A I R S dot org. That'll take you right to the Department of Elder Affairs in the state of Florida. And you'll go to Anna Therapeutic Robotic Pets. They're good for seniors and who are stuck at home and they're alone and they're isolated or they have Alzheimer's and they need something. Did you see it? Close up. He actually barks and <coughs> moves and. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can sit in your lap. <laughs> See if his heart starts beating. It's okay. You gonna say something? Oh. All right. Well, while the audience is enjoying the robotic dog, <laughs> we'll have our closing remarks um, from our very own Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Departments recreation manager who is in charge of our two city fitness centers. And um, I do wanna, uh, for those of you, I've got some returners here, you know, you know me, um, no part of Healthy You is ever about selling services. That's not what we're here for. You just heard Donna give, give out her number and her name ad nauseum. That's not what we're here for. We're here to talk. And that's what this young woman is gonna do next to me, is going to talk with you about fit, common sense, practical fitness, and how it helps with this topic. So take it away, Ms. Ann. Microphone, Ms. Patty. So I kinda of wanted to start with, I wanted to jump off of what our speaker was talking about earlier about nutrition, because a few of you had asked that nutrition and exercise, it's all so super duper important. So my mother started, um, I would say around 60, she had some issues, we thought she forgot things, you know, probably like everybody does. Well, it turns out, bless her heart, she lived to 92, but she had Alzheimer's. She was in a nursing home for 15 years, progressively got worse and worse and worse, we just couldn't, you know, do it on our own. But before we put her in a nursing home, I guess she was maybe around the age of 70, she needed hip replacements. She couldn't, I mean, her, her cognitive ability was taking a nosedive. Everything that could happen wrong was happening. She insisted on living alone. She thought she could drive. Um, anyway, she wasn't getting what she needed, so I decided, ta-da, I'm going to swoop in and make this all better. I went up to Jacksonville, scooped her up, brought her back here to Port St. Lucie, hooked her up with some really fine orthopedic doctors. Um, but 
she needed a little bit of time to get healthy enough to have the surgeries. I see some head nods. I know we've probably heard this before. So I've been inf involved with fitness my entire life. I've only worked in fitness for uh, several years, but fitness has always been kind of a thing for me. Nutrition has always been kind of a thing for me. My mother's idea of a nutrition, you'll appreciate this, was a heaping bowl of ice cream and a chocolate chip cookie. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> However, um, we always had a really good relationship, but we butted heads, as mothers and daughters often do. She could no longer walk at that point. I had the old-time refrigerator with the old-time, I'm, ta I'm talking the 90s. I had the old-time refrigerator with the freezer on the top. Remember those? Okay, all right. So mom's in a wheelchair. Guess what mom can't reach? The ice cream. Put it on the top shelf, back corner. Can't get it herself. Mom, eat your broccoli. Eat your grilled chicken, eat your carrots, whatever, you know, whatever the balanced meal was. She called my sister and said I was abusing her because I would not give her ice cream. Let me fast forward because this story can go on forever. When I started bribing her to eat her broccoli, I would give her ice cream. She would eat a nutritious meal, I would give her ice cream. Mind you, ice cream, not ice cream right right guess what mom started reading the newspaper again she started having conversations again it was not the ice cream <laughs> to to the intellectual side of your presentation nutrition was affecting her brain in a very positive way. Bribery was what got her there, but nutrition was affecting her brain. She was now communicating with the doctors that were going to do surgery and replace her hips. She did well. She did well for 10 years after that, eight years after that. You know, more forgetful, more things like that, but it slowed the progression. It slowed it. Guess where my exercise came in? Getting her to walk. Push her in a wheelchair, then I'd get her up walking. We'd do the whole, you know, what is that walker thing? So the other point that I want to make is for those of you, and probably everyone in here has someone in their house or in their family or a friend or someone that they're dealing with or knows, if you're taking care of that person, you have to take care of yourself. I see some familiar faces who come to our fitness centers on a very regular basis. We have quite an elder population in this particular fitness center. And COVID and isolation and just everything that has happened in the past year, the impact from wh what we saw individuals let's say January of 2020, is that right, 2020? <laughs> and now has been, there's been an obvious effect because socialization, as you brought up, wasn't happening. Interacting with other people wasn't happening. People come in that fitness center and most fitness centers, you can have all ages because all ages need to stay fit and all ages need to have good nutrition and all ages need to have, you know, brain stimulation, socialization, all that kind of thing. But no one gets upset if someone works out for 15 minutes and talks for 20. The only time we get upset is when people come and sing to us. not going to name any names. There's no one in this room that does that. But you know what? That's okay. We have, 
We have interactions with people. We have ongoing jokes with people. If I see you all the time and you can remember some little silly thing and we pick it up every time we see each other, that's working your brain. Am I correct? And you're making a connection. And maybe you look forward to me harassing you that day or I'm not giving you ice cream. <laughs> so, you know, the city of Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation, we have gorgeous parks, we have beautiful facilities, we have two fitness centers, we had Mental Health Awareness Month in May where we gave free classes out in our parks. The story that you told, there was a woman who came and she came late and she didn't want to join because she was late because she supposedly had a hard time finding the park. And then she came another time and didn't get out of her car. It took her three times to get out of her car because of anxiety. And then there was a lady who came who hadn't been out of her house. We need socialization. We need it. And you can get it in a fitness center, in a park. Walk down the street and say hi to your neighbor. You can say hi to your neighbor from the end of the driveway and not catch a thing, I promise you. You can. You can. We just have to get out and move our bodies. Our bodies are meant to move. When we move our bodies, our brains feel better. We get fresh air. We see different things. You might run into somebody and talk to somebody. We, if you want to come to our fitness centers, we would love to have you. But you know what? Just, just do something for yourself, especially if you're taking care of somebody. You are always going to be good to that person, but how much better are you going to be if you're good to yourself? Right? Sometimes we get so frustrated, we get so worn down, there's so much to do, we feel like we're the only one. As Patty said, we're not alone, we're not the only one. Walk, walk to your mailbox and look up at the sky and breathe in the air. Do something for yourself that makes you feel better. Find something good. Take care of yourself, and you'll be a better caretaker. If you want to come to our fitness centers, we'll help take care of you. If you don't want to come to our fitness centers, what's that park I like, Patty? Rivergate. Rivergate Park, across from the post office, on Veterans Memorial Parkway, it's beautiful. There's a lovely pavilion. It's right by the river. How can you not sit in nature with fresh air and listen to the river and not feel better about everything? It helps. Breathe in the air. It's good. Do it for yourself. I want you to come to fitness centers or take walks or work out. I want you to eat nutritious food. It's good for you, and we all know it, and we just we don't treat ourselves as good as we should, but we can, and we will all help you. Anybody that has any questions, doesn't know where to go, you've offered so much help. The city can, can offer places to be if you just need a few minutes to yourself, peace and quiet. Sometimes we just need a minute to ourselves. I thank you guys very much for listening to me. I really didn't know what I was going to say tonight. I, I, have, I, have a, I had a mother who had it. My mother-in-law had Alzheimer's. My grandmother had dementia and Parkinson's. It seems to be Louie Body. We have a rock steady boxing program for people with Parkinson's, and we have a lot of dementia issues in that program. And you have to go with their conversations. Sometimes you have circular conversations, and you have to go with them. But the exercise that the people in those programs get helps them get to another day. It helps them keep clear and, and, and be able to, to be all that they can be. And, and they'll decline. They will. It just is, it happens. It happens to all of us. But it helps. It helps to slow it down. Medicine can't do everything. But exercise can do a lot. So do it for yourself. 
do it for your family member that you're taking care of or your friend or your whoever it is. And if there's anything Parks and Rec can do for you, we have a lot of options. You have a lot of options. There's a lot of options, and options are grand. I thank you for your time. And to sum it up, okay, that is the true, that's the very essence of why Healthy You is here. It's to connect these two. It's, it's connecting mental health with traditional parks and rec programming. And I get that question a lot. Why, you know, mental health and parks and rec? For those of you who are in person, um, I, would, I would offer you on your seat there is our annual publication and our monthly calendar of everything that is available to you as a resident or a guest of Port St. Lucie. For those of you at home, I've got the Inside the Outdoors, which is our uh, Parks and Rec guide um, that is put out annually. We're just starting on the next edition of it, so look for that to come out in October. Um, but this will tell you all the things that our department offers. Again, not here to sell anything. This woman has taught me through COVID um, because I, I move, but I don't move like she does, but that's okay. It's okay. So during COVID, if I, all I did was get up and walk to my mailbox, I'm okay. I'm all right. That's, that's taking care of self. So that's what Healthy You is all about, is connecting people. Um, and Donna, I cannot thank you enough. This was a fantastic conversation. You guys with all your interactive questions and empath I could, I could you know, read the empathy and the, pa the passion in your eyes. Um, I thank you all, you're very courageous people for coming out um, and sharing this important message. I do wanna share just the next session, which is our session number 10. And that will be, it's right back here, offered via Zoom too. We're gonna do a little bit different setup in the room we're gonna to try to make it kind of, in my uh, old words, um, kind of more of a living room setup, if you will, um, so that it kind of enters into a little bit more conversation. Um, so we're gonna do all that also via Zoom though. Um, and that topic is going to be on eating disorders. And we've got Dr. Anushka Marshall coming. She is um, a, I wanna say three time presenter for Healthy You. Um, she is an exceptional uh, she's the clinical, um, uh, the chief clinical officer for Tykes and Teens in Palm City. Uh, so she will be presenting on eating disorders. Please come back and see us. It will be on Wednesday, August 4th, also at 6.30 right here at the Community Center. Again, you have been an absolutely phenomenal um, audience, both at home and here, and I wish you a safe and uh, restful weekend and night. Thank you. <laughs>